from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good evening, and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Library of Congress's Center for the Book. It's the book, reading, and literacy arm of the Library of Congress, which also takes a special interest in promoting the history of books, reading, lit literacy, and libraries. Uh, we were created by Daniel Borston when he was the Librarian of Congress in 1977. Uh, to reach out uh, to the general public uh, to promote books and reading uh, in the name of the Library of Congress. And so I'm very lucky. Uh, I have a job that also keeps me closely involved with wonderful Library of Congress activities such as the National Book Festival, which we held very successfully, much to our surprise, amazement, and delight <laughs> on Labor Day Saturday and you will be one of the first groups to know, we don't have a date yet, but we have pretty much decided again to our surprise and amazement that we're going to stay at the convention center and be there to try to move it a little bit uh, further towards the fall than the Labor Day weekend we got stuck with. But in a way it was our own fault because we actually wanted, felt we wanted to stay on the mall and we did until we lost it and were late in getting the room at the convention center. So in another year, next year we will be at the convention center and then we will settle in, I think, and it has many advantages. Uh, the Center for the Book also has other responsibilities within the library. Uh, one of them is a new one and that is on behalf of the Young Readers Center at the Library of the Congress. We are going to be joining with the University of Maryland in a variety of cooperative activities. Uh, the Young Reader Center was opened uh, under the auspices of the Center for the Book in 2009. I'm also a historian of the Library of Congress, and so I know that this was especially significant. It was the first time in our, at the time, the 2000, uh, 209 years uh, that we'd opened a space directly for service to kids. For under 16, accompanied by an adult, it's a place, not a reading room, but a reading, wonderful reading and knowledge creating space. And it's in the Jefferson Building. The room was made available, the rooms were made available when our motion picture broadcasting and recorded sound division moved to Culpeper, Virginia, thanks to a private gift. Uh, and that was a wonderful way to create space and. Um, our Librarian of Congress, James Billington, realized the importance of uh, looking at younger readers and uh, the new educational role of the Library of Congress, which we've been playing actually about since the time the Center for the Book was created in 1977. And uh, we we're fortunate to have uh, that space. Uh, tonight I was able to take a small group of you uh, to see the Young Reader Center. And I want to take this opportunity to uh, introduce Karen Jaffe, who is in the front row, who is the director. And I would like Karen to stand and be known. <laughs> she's, she's doing a wonderful job and has a point of view that helps mirror for young people what has happening in the rest of the Library of Congress in the sense that we have major exhibits throughout the Library of Congress, our new civil rights, uh, under Karen's leadership, there would be a small exhibit aimed at young people on the subject of civil rights. For the first time, we have uh, other related displays that emphasize how, in fact, the entire Library of Congress, whether they know it or not, you know, does help young people. And so having the Young Reader Center gives us a focal point uh, for these activities which magnify the importance of the Library of Congress itself in American life and American culture. And Thomas Jefferson, I always think, when I think about the opening of the uh, Young Reader Center, uh, would be smiling on this because initially, he, this is the last part of your history lesson, I promise. Um, initially, uh, when Jefferson 
uh, when the British burned the Capitol, the first location of the Library of Congress, uh, in 1814, Jefferson, who'd helped nurse this new little library, was in Monticello. He sold his comprehensive library at cost back to the Congress to begin again with the Library of Congress, but he also hoped that this valuable collection which covered all subjects would be the substratum, he said it would be the substratum someday for a great national library. And gradually that happened after the Civil War, but it didn't really happen until we had a reading room for people under 16, and that didn't happen until 2009. So I hope you'll have a chance to see the Young Reader Center, and on behalf of Karen and the rest of the library, I'm very pleased to be part of this new lecture series and a partnership with the University of Maryland. Thank you very much and welcome again. Well, good afternoon and welcome. My name's Jennifer Priest, and I'm the Dean of the College of Information Studies, Maryland's iSchool, and I want to welcome you all here. But just before I do that, I also want to thank John for his wonderful history lesson. I'm sorry, you can tell my accent's British, right? I'm sorry the Brits were so bad in the past, <laughs> but can't be responsible for all of them. Um, so thank you very much, John, and thank you to all of your staff and everybody for just this amazing location. I mean, this is just a wonderful place for tonight's event. So. And I think it was made very special by your introduction, John. So thank you very, very much. Um, so uh, Maryland's College of Information Studies, the iSchool is, of course, not as old as the Library of Congress. But one of the things that I did want to mention to you is that we are a very multidisciplinary um, College of Information Studies, iSchool. And we are actually also celebrating. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year and next. And don't ask me how you've managed to have a 50th anniversary that stretches over two years, but we're managing to do that. Um, so I, I just want to mention that because I think that's an important feature of our school and it also links in a little bit with um, tonight's event. Um, I'm just very happy to uh, be one of the people to really very warmly welcome you. And I'm, I'm thrilled to see so many of you here, uh, so many faculty, staff, visitors, alums, many alums here. Um, it's a little bit of a pity that Anne Scott McLeod couldn't be here tonight because I'm sure she would have, you know, really been very happy to um, hear that this lecture tonight is, is being held at the Library of Congress. Um, but we actually, interestingly, we have, um, I think, people who know Anne Scott McLeod here, and um, Diane Barlow will be probably a little embarrassed that I'm going to say this, but Anne was one of Diane's uh, students, so we have some of Diane's PhD students here as well. That's what I, didn't, isn't that what I said? You were one of her students. Yeah, yeah. So Diane was one of Anne's first um, doctoral students and many people have benefited hugely uh, from, from Anne's presence. And she in fact joined uh, the College of Information Studies in 1973 and was really responsible um, for helping to make us, our college a very interdisciplinary uh, college and to, um, bring children's literature to the forefront and make that a very respectable and much cherished uh, academic study area. And of course now we have many people who are interested in youth, youth scholarship, children's literature, and many other topics related to youth and reading. So I think John will probably be pleased to hear that. So just having this lecture in this, in this wonderful place is um, just a pleasure. So I very warmly welcome all of you and thank you very, very much for coming tonight. And uh, some of you I know, some of you are new faces, but if I, uh, if, if I don't know you, then I hope you'll keep in touch with the college. Many faculty and staff are here. And let me just finish by thanking very much all the faculty and staff who've helped and worked with our colleagues at the Library of Congress um, to uh, make this a nice event for us tonight. And you'll hear a bit more about that. But I have great pleasure now 
in introducing uh, Maria Salvadori, who's going to introduce us to tonight's speaker. So thank you all for coming. I'd like to add my, my welcome to everybody, but I'd also like to invite readers to travel through time and the United States to meet Felicity, Josefina, Samantha, Kit, and other girls. They can visit a summer camp where Nate and Zach, among others, uh, confront and overcome challenges that have bearing on everyday lives well beyond the, the confines of their camp. These and other characters continue to resonate with readers, both young and experienced, when they meet the characters created by Valerie Tripp. She's written over 31 American Girl books and is the creative editor behind uh, a new series called Boys Camp. Books and stories have always been important to Valerie. She was born and raised not far from New York City in Mount Kisco, New York, where words and language seemed a part of the fabric of her family. Words continued in importance to Miss Tripp as she continued her education and in her career. She graduated from Yale University's first co-educational class and later did graduate work at Harvard University, focusing on reading education. In addition to the American Girl and Boys Camp books, uh, Valerie has been a freelance writer for educational publishers as well as other major trade publishing houses. In an article in, uh, that she wrote and which can be read on her website, Ms. Tripp answers the question most often asked to her by children and I would guess adults too, where do you get your ideas for your books? Her response, and I quote, uh, I have concocted this lofty answer. The ideas come from research, memory, and imagination. But in fact, those three words are euphemisms. She goes on to explain that she's really a snoop, an empathetic daydreamer. Additionally, she has a good memory, and so many of, of Valerie's experiences, including her hands-on work with children, find their way into books. This creates an emotional authenticity in all of her work that resonates with readers of all ages and backgrounds. Please join me in welcoming the 2014 Anne Scott McLeod Lecture, a sensitive snoop who remembers the essence of her own childhood to delight readers today, Valerie Tripp. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Let me get all settled here. I'm actually always reassured when I see, you know, a speaker come up and have something written down. So you figure it's not, you know, it's not going to be like a stream of consciousness <laughs> that is organized. So thank you very much. I'm so honored to be here today. It's just, it's like a dream come true. And it's maybe all of you who work here take it for granted, but to walk into a building that's you know part of the Library of Congress and you know have a purpose for being here is just just really exhilarating. So thank you very very much, and thank you for the opportunity to present the Anne Scott McLeod lecture. Um, Maria invited me back in February, so my wonderful husband who is here has heard me talking about ideas for this speech for eight months, <laughs> eight months. And really, I have to say, the idea of making this speech has been a gift from you. So thank you very much. It has been a lens through which I have sort of evaluated everything that I've read or experienced or encountered in the last eight months. It's really been a kick in the consciousness. And it's been a reason to um, analyze, not without the occasional dismay, my work habits and my more dogged uh, passions as well. So I'm, I'm grateful to you for that. It's really led me to challenge assumptions, and so hence the title of my uh, talk today. And it's been an excuse to do research, which of course I, I love to do, so I'm grateful for that too. But mostly, mostly, thinking about what I would say today was a reason to think about what I do and how much I love what I do, which is writing stories for her children. Uh, don't, don't you just love books? Don't, don't you just love? Don't you especially, I think, love books for children? I think, I, you know, I just, um, 
we're all really lucky to be engaged with them. I'm going to make a very non-challenging assumption right now that all of us are book lovers here. We're either writers or librarians or media specialists, researchers, editors, and readers. And I, I think there's something about being involved with children's literature that just um, nurtures optimism. You can't help it. You just can't help it. The children are the very embodiment of, they are the personification of promise and potential, and wacky though they are. They, and we're right there, we're right on the spot um, to witness how books and stories nourish their growth. Um, I know that writing for children in and of itself is an optimistic and sometimes I feel a foolishly optimistic act, sort of a leap of faith, a cheerful trust in uh, transformation that maybe, you know, out of chaos, a s order and a story will emerge and maybe even that sort of, you know, ping moment of connection with your reader, that way you know it's really resonated with your reader. And all of you who are lucky enough to be the people who hand the books and stories to children, know that you're changing their lives. You are changing their lives. Is there anything more wonderful than saying to a child, I think you're gonna like this book. And guess what, good news, there's more where that came from. I mean, I just, I, it, there's, it's children's books leave an indelible impression, and an indelible imprint, and they shape and color and influence the way a child perceives the world. And the books we read as children, I think, serve as a measure of all the books that follow. So I brought with me, where did she go here? I brought with me a book my sister gave me, <laughs> what did I do with her? I brought Understood Betsy that my sister gave me. It was a scholastic book, 35 cents from the Scholastic Book Club. Here we go. <laughs> when I was eight, so here we have a book that is clearly well loved. And you know the phrase about I ate it up? Evidently, I chewed it up. So I just love Understood. And I reread Understood Betsy at least once a year. Understood Betsy, this very book, and also The Sherwood Ring by uh, Elizabeth Marie Pope are the reason why I became a children's book writer and a writer of historical fiction. Those books that you put in children's hands are going to have an enormous influence on them their whole life long. So I'm going to assume that you chose your profession because of how much you love books and stories and reading now and as much that you loved it when you were a child. And just because sometimes the work part of doing what we love overcomes the love part of doing what, what our work is, I want us to all just take a moment and just luxuriate and reflect for a moment about why we love books. Um, as Anne Lamott says in Bird by Bird, to some of us, Bird books are as important as almost anything else on earth. What a miracle it is that out of these small, flat, rigid squares of paper unfolds world after world after world, worlds that sing to you, comfort and quiet or excite you. Books help us understand who we are and how we are to behave. An author makes you notice, makes you pay attention, and this is a great gift. But. I am here to say it's a gift that would remain unwrapped if it weren't for all of you. I'm determined to get you all fired up by reminding you about why you do what you do and talk about assumptions. As I was writing this, my mother's voice was in my ear saying, don't assume people know how grateful you are. Say thank you. So I'm saying thank you to, to all of you too. Reading still seems like a miracle to me and books too because they never let you down. They're good companions. They don't waste your time. They don't need to be recharged with or plugged in or ru ruin your circadian rhythm, you know, with blue light. And they are, you know, just good and rich and deep and eternally, eternally, a book says, enter, enter, come again. Uh, Richard Wilbur expresses this very beautifully in his poem called The Reader. She's going back these days to the great stories that charmed her younger mind, knowing as she does what will become of them in bloody field or Tuscan garden. It may be that at times she sees their first and final selves at once as a god might to whom all time is now. 
But the true wonder of it is that she, for all she may know of consequences, still turns enchanted to the next bright page. Isn't that lovely? Isn't that lovely? And I think it's a wise idea to go back and reread books too, because as Billy Collins reminds us in his poem, Forgetfulness, the name of the author is the first to go, followed obediently by the title, the plot, the heartbreaking conclusion, the entire novel, which suddenly <laughs> becomes one you've never read, never even heard of. So <laughs> I think it behooves all of us to read and reread. It's kind of like when you say to yourself, now, you know, I know there's a reason why I came into this room. I just can't remember what it, what it is. But both Wilbur and Collins do assume that the story got into your head somehow. And I'm going to say that probably it was some wonderful librarian's generous act of giving you that book. So to say thank you, I want to supply you with some facts. The next time someone looks up, you know, from his cell phone and says, oh, you know, libraries are soon uh, to be a thing of the past. So here's what I want you to say innocently, sort of lure him into a false sense of security. Oh, oh, do you think so? And then I want you to knock his socks off with the following, uh, uh, challenge his assumption by saying, this is the first of four assumptions you'll hear in the speech. So you can you know, keep track on your fingers. This, this is number one. So the assumption that libraries are soon to be out of date. There are 123,291 libraries of all kinds in the United States. And more than 20 years after some people predicted the demise of libraries because of the internet, in fact, the exact opposite has occurred. Visits increased 61% between 1994 and 2004, and now in 2014 they topped 2 billion. No wonder you're tired at the end of the day. <laughs> Despite widespread belief that libraries are funded by the federal government, in fact, a whopping 81% comes from local tax dollars. That means the funding comes from the people the library serves. That's why the library is the heart of the community. And that's why you are the stewards of a treasure that's part of the heart of the community. And those are just the cold hard facts. Once you've won your point with statistics, I want you to go on to enjoy your victory and pursue your doubting Thomas, reminding him that you put books in the hands of children, books with which they will construct their characters, their view of the world, their ideas of the purpose and challenge of life. Books stretch children's brains and hearts and give them a sense of themselves as unique beings with contributions to make. Books spark interests, feed passions, ignite ambitions. They are an ongoing, reliable source of entertainment, education, rest, and reflection reflection. The books you give children introduce those children to characters and therefore teach the children empathy and compassion. I saw a recent study that said reading fiction improves one's ability to understand others. You think? I mean, <laughs> really? Uh, it, took, uh, it took a study to figure that out and my friend Eddie Ch Edie Ching points out that so does nonfiction. Of course, nonfiction stories have heart and emotion in addition to, of course, providing facts that will give a child a sense of mastery and curiosity and give children a sense that they too can contribute to their community, whether it's friends or family or, or the world. Nonfiction can teach children about other cultures and religions and tastes and senses of humor. So they'll connect and feel and hear and experience the ex excitement of discovery. So I want you also to be sure to point out to your cell phone doubting Thomas that these um, book-influenced, empathetic children will be caring for him in his dotage. <laughs> so doesn't he want to be sure that that's an empathetic, caring person? By connecting children with books, you're exposing them to the correct way to express themselves in written language so that they may connect with others and discipline themselves to articulate what is in their hearts and minds. As Margaret Edson, the author of Wit, writes, sitting by yourself, Forcing the swirl of thoughts into a linear, systematic journey forward, it makes you smarter. It's like a pastry bag, literacy is. It presses you into one clear line. So writing teaches discipline. Writing's tricky, though. This is me talking now. Writing's tricky, though, because it's like asking a bunch of uh, you know, goldfish to line up, or, or, or even just to show up reliably. So where do ideas come from? This leads me to assumption number two. We often hear writers should write what they know. Um, and this, this is a challenging assumption. So you can see we're using challenge both as a verb and an adjective here. So. Writers should write from their own experience. So uh, OK, but I sure do hope that that means imaginative experience. In the world of children's books, there's lots of discussion and debate about who has the right to tell which story. 
Must an author live a story to write it? Is it presumptuous, insulting, condescending to put myself in someone else's skin, especially if it's a different color? Putting aside the question of whether or not I do it well, and granting that, of course, the more varied voices we hear, the more authors of different races and backgrounds and cultures, the better, isn't the fact that an author tries a testament to empathy and compassion. If we don't trust our imaginations, what hope is there for us? We write to elucidate, to celebrate, and if I stumble and fail and fall, if there's a lack of authenticity, could there be worth in that failure? for what it reveals, I, I don't know. But I do think it is especially important to tell children, go ahead and write about that person who is different. You're not bounded by the limits of your own experience, kid. In her essay, The Right to Write, Roxanne Robinson calls this radical empathy. And in another place, she defines it as bearing compassionate witness. I love that phrase, bearing compassionate witness. She says, to what it is to be alive in this place and time. So I'd say the very act of writing itself pushes a child to challenge assumptions about himself. And writing teaches responsibility. Kathleen Norris says, when intended to communicate, the writer is accountable to the reader. She must be hospitable and welcoming. I love this part, humble in cutting what's dear but show-offy. It's her job to focus attention. She's engaged in experiencing the world with the eye and the ear of the heart. We write in solitude, but our readers constitute a community. So children write to delight, to entertain, to engage, to connect. And connecting leads us to assumption number three. We're really tearing through these assumptions. Look at this. We're going to be at the reception in no time. Assumption number three. <laughs> Another challenging assumption about the receiving end of stories. The stories we give children have to, of course, be fueled by understandable humor, shared experience, common aspirations. They must delight with relatable mischief, joy, and friendship. We assume we're doing a child a favor by giving him a book, children a favor by giving them books that have an obvious connection to their lives. But I'd like to sort of challenge that assumption as well, so, uh, gently. I recently read a study about resilience, why some children survive and even thrive in terrible circumstances. And a reliable adult figure is key, but so too is imagination. Imagination, imagination, which when you think about it is a branch of hope is the ability to imagine different outcomes, different circumstances, a different life, a different self. So shouldn't books stretch a child? We don't know actually what's going to form the bridge, what's going to forge the connection, and we should not underestimate our child readers. We have to engage our readers, the children where they are, yes, meet their interest, ability, comprehension, and background, and existing knowledge, but above all, respect them. Readers are smart enough, boy, if I've learned anything in the last 27 years, it's the readers are smart enough to understand that, for example, in the kit books, the depression is a metaphor for any undeserved whack or wallop your family might take. Readers saw before I did that Josefina's aunt was like a stepmother and that they understood her divided loyalties between her mother and her stepmother. Molly's dad went off to war. The children absolutely understood that that was a metaphor. That was just another way of talking about something that happened in their lives, too, when parents went away or moved away or left to find a job or something. These young readers are sharp. They are sharp. And I believe if the emotion is genuine, the specific is less important. I know I myself am not particularly interested in reading a story about somebody who's like me. Geez Louise, I spend all day with me. <laughs> I would much rather read about somebody else. I'm taking a class and we read Madame Bovary. And you sit there, you read Madame Bovary, and you say, oh, she's so much more of a hot mess than I am. I love her. Oh my gosh. Emma, that's fabulous. And then I sort of realized, yeah, but you know how she... She's always seeking out something new, and she pursues, you know, for she marries poor Dr. Bovary, and then she's with that guy, Rodolfo, that anybody could see a mile away. He was a bad bed, and then here comes Leon, and then she spends all the money. And you say, oh, gosh, you know, she's just hopeless. And then I thought, well, yeah, but, you know, don't I every single mo Monday morning of my life say, okay, eat less, exercise more, and clean out a closet after dinner. 
You know, and then after dinner, you hear yourself saying, hey, honey, do we have any fudge sauce to put on this ice cream? <laughs> so maybe Madame Bovary and I are not that different. We read books about people who are different from us to humble ourselves. You know, in addition to making ourselves feel better about ourselves, we also, we, they also humble us. And I think that that's a very important thing to do. I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and very dulling and self-defeating to say children only want to read about children like themselves. And worse, that the book had to be written by somebody like themselves. That's how you end up in an us-them mindset. I think. That's why I love historical fiction, because it provides a vicarious experience. It's a way to hold on to the past, travel to a place you've never been, learn about a world beyond your own experience. Emotion is the captivator, and the driving force may be friendship. Historical fiction can present subtleties, two sides or more, to a question. The history has to be accurate and authentic, and that's tricky. Because as Toni Morrison says, the past is not done. The past is not over. It's still very much in process. And the past's very unfamiliarity should be, not be diminished. Here's what, guess who? Anne Scott McCloud has to say about historical fiction. It's just fabulous. She writes, but people of the past were not just us in odd clothing. Isn't that great? They were people who saw the world differently, approached human relationships differently, people for whom night and day, heat and cold, seasons and work and play had meanings lost to an industrialized world. Even if human nature is much the same over time, human experience, perhaps especially everyday experience, is not. To wash these differences out of historical fiction is not only a denial of historical truth, but a failure of imagination and understanding that is as important to the present as to the past. Isn't that incredible? That was in an article she wrote for Hornbook Magazine in 1998. So I always think, okay, the story has to be intimate and infinite. It has to be unique and universal. But as Pleasant always used to say, the best book in the world is useless if it's just sitting on a shelf gathering dust. And that's why librarians and booksellers and teachers and you and I are all partners. You recommend a book or hand a book to a child. And when you do, I'm hoping that you will consider sort of deeper resonances, you know, go out on a limb a little bit. That brings us to assumption four, well, I called it four, but really it's sort of three and a half. So I, it, it's that I've sort of been on, on the skinny branches for a while because of uh, boys camp. About five years ago, two really great women, mothers of sons, came to me and said, you know, we don't think books have done for boys what they did for girls, which is to say to girls, you know, go for it, pursue whatever your passion is, don't let anybody bully you or tease you or cajole you out of that. My boys camp partners and I didn't recognize in the books that we were reading for boys, the, book, the boys that we knew in real life who were adventurous and kind and curious and quirky and had rich interior lives. The boys in the books didn't seem to be full of promise and potential to grow up to be like the men we knew and loved and respected. Men as described by Kenneth, Kenneth Roxroth in an essay he wrote called The Mature Man. The mature man lives quietly does good privately, assumes personal responsibility for his actions, treats others with friendliness and courtesy, finds mischief boring, and keeps out of it. Isn't that lovely? And the statistics bear out that men's roles are changing as well. The number of stay-at-home fathers has doubled from 1.1 million in 1989 to 2 million in 2012. So Anne and Peggy and I wanted to provide children with books about boys who were likable, brave, and thinking. Now, don't think I'm being altruistic care. I, I, I want to, quite frankly, better boys for girls to share the world with. Um, and not <laughs> boys, as a recent New York Times article classified men in movies and TV as either mad, sad, or bad. Remember that nurse who's going to care for us in our dotage? Don't we want him to be a man who's thoughtful, empathetic, articulate, capable of self-control and patient? I'm not doing boys camp out of the goodness of my heart. And if you want another kick in the pants, it's passe, it's outdated, it's old fogey to think of men and boys as doofuses who can't express feelings. I actually don't believe in hardwiring. I believe in haywiring. Yep, messy, open-ended, changing all the time, contradictory, situational-based. And there's still plenty of work to be done in countering what is called the male gaze. Oh my gosh, I was horrified. I went on the Montgomery County Public School website to read about this curriculum too that they're doing. 19 children are illustrated, five are girls. Of those five, one's losing a running race to boys, one's being helped by a bigger boy to hold a pencil, and one has little ruffles across her chest 
I mean, it just made me want to burst into flames. That, that brings us to assumption number four. Speaking of bursting into flames, and assumption number four is bummer books are honest. I think it be actually betrays an anger, a resentment, a bitterness, and even jealousy toward children when we keep lowering the age at which we depress them. I'd like to challenge the assumption that we're doing a child a favor to do so. I believe in levels of appropriate disclosure. I think as writers, we have a responsibility to at least hint at redemption. Otherwise, as readers and as parents, we'll reap what we've sown. And otherwise, I think, as readers and parents and teachers, we should be angry. It's as if the author takes us for a ride in a car, drops us off far from home, and leaves us there with no map. It's lazy, it's selfish, it's self-indulgent, and it's mean. And though the world has changed, I think what our child readers need has not changed. They need to feel safe. They need to feel loved before they can feel free. They need to feel supported, not unchallenged, but supported. And what they read should celebrate being observant. It should celebrate hope and optimism and a cheerful skepticism that will lead them to challenge assumptions. And you know, I'm just gonna say, I think sarcasm is lazy humor. I don't think it's charming. I think vulgarity is pitiful. I think people laugh out of embarrassment and unease at things like that. I think stereotypes are false at best and murderous at worst. And we hobble children when we teach them to be cynical. Cynicism is not the same thing as critical detachment. And pessimism does not, pessimism does not equal smarts. So I'm reading along and firing out and writing up this speech and everything. And then, you know, at the end of the day, I uh, picked up American Childhood by Ann Scott McLeod. And I get to page 209. And she has written, finally, when the awful weight of negativism is measured, and the failures, disappointments, and betrayals in contemporary children's books are tallied together, another observation is hard to avoid. The literature is fundamentally anti-child. Something in the eagerness of the authors to acquaint children with all the terrors of contemporary world, the contemporary world, their unwillingness to offer any perspective or corrective to puerile emotions, something in the joylessness of the fiction as a whole goes beyond the requirements of an unflinching realism designed, as its apologists claim, to prepare children for the real world. Holy smokes, how do you like that? I'll tell you what, Ann Scott McLeod. This is why it pays to read. The, the woman who's, I'm giving a speech in honor of her name has better ex express more articulately for myself exactly the main point I want to make. This feather was right there on page 209. I was actually say with more four, I was a little timid, I thought. But old Anne Scott McLeod's come right out there and unflinching. She did not back away from this at all. So she's saying to authors and to people who give children books, you know, shield the joyous. Give the kid a chance. And I'm going to say to those authors and writers, I think you're wrong. Um, I love this poem by Sheena Pugh. It's called Sometimes. Sometimes things don't go, after all, from bad to worse. Some years, muscadel faces down frost. Green thrives. The crops don't fail. Sometimes a man aims high, and all goes well. A people will sometimes step back from war, elect an honest man, decide they care enough that they can't leave some stranger poor. Some men become what they were born for. Sometimes our best efforts do not go amiss. Sometimes we do as we meant to. The sun will sometimes melt a field of sorrow that seemed hard frozen. May it happen for you. Oh, now I have a post-it note here to myself, it says Aunt Max. And the reason why I have this post-it note for, for, that says Aunt Max is it's a reminder to me that now that I've you know, waxed so eloquent and everything, I, I did read your invitation and you were supposed to, I think it was um, listen, learn, and enjoy. And it was that I was invited for my expertise. And I just wanted to tell this story about my Aunt Max because it ties into expertise. When Aunt Max was 86 years old, the, mem the people who lived in her retirement home were invited to come and play with the orchestra of an elementary school. Aunt Max played the violin. So she was second chair, second violin with a, a fifth grade girl. And at the very first rehearsal, a woman in the front row, first chair, first violin, turned to Aunt Max and her uh, music stand partner and said, now, if you don't know what to do, or if, if there's something you don't understand, just watch me, just do what I do. So Aunt Max and the little girl said, yeah, okay. 
And after the first chair, first violin lady turned around again, and the little girl turned to Aunt Max and said, show off. <laughs> so I always like to tell that story about Aunt Max because I'm not trying to show off and I'm just trying to, to, I'm trying to sort of humbly uh, share with you the things that I feel very passionate about and two things I'm sure of at least. And one is that we should act as if, as C.S. Lewis says, we don't know, so what's to lose by learning toward the good, especially as we nurture and fuel our young readers. And secondly, doesn't hope at least deserve equal time, at least in, especially in what we give children. Eleanor Roosevelt said the most important word in the English language is hope. So I charge you to go forth and challenge the assumption that reality is grim, dysfunction is rife, and we're doing children a favor by depressing them. We're not. And in so saying, I, I feel a responsibility to you because if I were you, I'd be saying, who is she again? What? Doesn't she, what, didn't she write that book about Molly? What is she talking about C.S. Lewis for? So I feel a responsibility to you to tell you sort of where this all came from. So I'm gonna share with you a little project I've had going. Um, it, I was raised as a Catholic and I majored in philosophy and the older I get, the more humbly I accept my complete confusion on all matters religious. But in an effort to get a foothold, I'm, I'm, here's my project. I'm looking for evidence that the universe is benign or at least we're not, totally ridiculous to be optimistic. And so I've come up with six things, not exactly proof, but six evidences. So see what you think of these. The first one is healing. You know, people get better from illness or from heartbreak. As Emily Dickinson writes, we grow accustomed to the dark when light is put away, as when the neighbor holds the lamp to witness her goodbye. A moment, we uncertain step for newness of the night, then fit our vision to the dark and meet the road erect and so of larger darknesses those evenings of the brain, when not a moon disclose a sign or star come out within. The bravest grope a little and sometimes hit a tree directly in the forehead, but as they learn to see, either the darkness alters or something in the sight adjusts itself to midnight and life steps almost straight. So things get better, things get better. My second evidence is forgiveness. It's that moment when you realize uh, the heat's gone, you're just not mad anymore. And my third one is learning, that it turns out no matter how old you are, you can, actually, you can learn to do new things. I, I recently said in a moment of weakness that I would write a mystery, and I've loved writing the mystery. I, I, it turns out you can learn how to do something new, and that's, to me, a lovely proof of, of the benign in, benignness of the universe. And again, to quote Eleanor Roosevelt, you must do the thing you think you cannot do. And the more cheerful concept that I learned a while ago called a Stendhal, Stendhal moment, that French author, I don't know how to say his name, I'll have to learn how to do that. But that's a moment of sheer awe. You know that moment where you go, I get it. It's, you know, you're, you're trying to do something on your computer or something and you think, oh, I get it. I, I, I find that a very, a very optimistic uh, signal from the universe. And then the fourth thing is growing, you know, trees, and children, stuff like that. There's a lot of sorrow and loss, of course, along the way. That's inevitable, but uh, growing and changing, we might as well see it as good because uh, there's nothing we can do about it. And it usually leads children to independence. And the fifth thing is music, uh, inexplicable. And the sixth thing is the discipline to just do the thing and get it done, which if you're lucky, sort of transitions to absorption. You know how you sit and do work and you're just trying to you know, make, get the meaning to come out of the chaos and really all of you just wants to go, I don't know, just walk the dog or something, but you stick at it and then sometimes inexplicably this sort of miraculous immersion in concentration, this white space happens and you look out the window and you think, oh gosh, it got dark. I mean, you just, you, somehow you've made that transition so that that moment that you can't make happen, but if you stick at it, sometimes does happen, that transition into immersion to me also feels pretty miraculous. Now I'm toying with the idea of a seventh thing which is inventions like air conditioning and slow cookers as evidence that the <laughs> universe is moving in a positive direction but that's very dicey because as Lily Tomlin says, I worry that the person who invented Muzak is inventing something else. <laughs> so I'm not really sure we can, I'm not really sure we can 
add, you know, uh, can really uh, trust inventions. So you're saying, okay, you know, thank you, Valerie, that's, that's just so sweet. Um, and you can cite to me, you know, opposites, illnesses, anger, but I think that's self-defeating. I think it stalls you to sort of on, it just strands you on a, a, a morass, an icy, you know, iceberg of, of, of cold comfort. Um, and maybe I'm optimistic because, as I said before, the very act of writing for children in and of itself is an act of hope and transformation that out of chaos emerges order and story. Clarity is not usually present at the beginning. I'd be suspicious if clarity did seem to be present at the beginning of the process. It's a discovery, and the ideas emerge from the mist over time with energy, focus, desire, and discipline to make choices. I remember one time my daughter was saying to me, Mom, just write it right the first time. You know, seeing me write something over and over and over again, and I wish I could write it right the first time, but usually it takes many iterations to get the, to really be sure you're, you're saying what you really mean to say. So I believe when we write for children, we want to serve and respect them and to enrich the spot where they are right now, you know, curious and goofy and intense and cheerful. Children are in their lives independent readers, emerging as independent readers, and that's exactly where we want to meet them and encourage them to go deep and linger there and not to feel that they must rush off to any next stage of anything. We write to educate readers with facts about you know animals or history and also facts about our shared culture and stories, all the while respecting the reader enough to present multiple myable views. We want them to challenge given wisdom and challenge assumptions. When we write for children, we want to teach them that we can love people with whom we disagree, and we can disagree with people whom we love. We want to celebrate the values of tolerance and compassion as well as drive, hope, creativity, individuality, change, and work. Work. We want to clue them in to the secret of life, which is you didn't know you were going to find out the secret of life today, did you? Here, here, free of charge, here is the secret of life. The purpose of life is to find out the work we're here to do and do it. And I mean work. I mean service. I mean pushing past the point of pain when it's not fun anymore. It's like that March Piercy poem, To Be of Use, that goes, the people I love best jump into work head first without dallying in the shallows and swim off with sure strokes almost out of sight. The pitcher cries out for water to carry and a person for work that is real. So those hopeful assumptions not only underlie all that I write, they are also the view of life and the universe that I want children to trust and they lead to specific ideas for stories. In fact, the smart ones of you out there, which is of course all of you, have already figured out that under the guise of giving you useful information, I've actually just shown you and tried to validate what I do and why. So, fellow lovers of the book, I will end as I began by thanking you for giving me the impetus and inspiration to think about what I do and why. And I will send you forth with a sense of urgency about the moment we find ourselves in right now, urgency driven by our optimism or and challenges, not fear, but urgency all the same. Because at our backs we always hear time's winged chariot. Or, as Irma Bombeck wrote, seize the moment. Remember all those women on the Titanic who waved off the dessert cart. Ha! <laughs> 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 that, yeah, that's funnier the more you think about it. <laughs> or, as Rita Dove says in her poem, Dawn Revisited, the whole sky is yours to write on, blown open to a blank page. Come on, shake a leg. Thank you. I'm only going to be like a minute, I swear. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. Um, that was just wonderful. Um, and thank you so much for your contributions to uh, children's literature. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Listening to your talk brought back so many precious memories, you know? Um, I mean, Kit, Felicity, and Samantha were part of our family, frankly. Um, you know, sisters really to our three daughters, right? Um, and, and actually, in some days, I actually think they were the preferred sisters to our daughters, uh, <laughs> frankly, you know, uh, as we played referee on many occasions. Um, the American girls, though, weren't just friends. Uh, they were much more. They were a gateway to creativity, to literacy, and learning. 
They were an inspiration to all who read their stories and fostered a lifelong love of reading, engagement, compassion, cultural awareness, appreciation, excuse me, optimism, inquiry, and community. I mean, it was really a wonderful set of stories that you can impart and share in with your children. Uh, so thank you very much for that contribution. It was wonderful to have that. We know from many studies that multiple forms of literacy are essential for both professional and, and personal success. And it starts from birth, actually even before, right? You know, we read to, to children before they're even born now. At the iSchool, we're reinvigorating our focus on youth learning through new initiatives centered on lear reading, literacy, and what we are referring to YX, or digital youth. As we spend the next year re-envisioning the MLS, a key part of that is an integrative approach to youth learning, literature, literacy, design thinking, and digital media. Whether in a school, a public library, the Library of Congress, right, Discovery, National Geographic, Nickelodeon, PBS, or elsewhere, right, our future begins with the inspiration, love of learning, skills, and sense of accomplishment that, reading, that starts with reading. You know, one of the stories I remember, you, you had all these great funny stories. I'm not as funny as you are. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that you read about and, and sort of decry, I think, as a parent is we've taken away the small victories from children. You know, like little things like tying a shoe because we started with Velcro. We take away all these little things. And literacy is actually a major victory. It's an accomplishment. Um, every, have you ever watched your child when they first read? They can actually look at those words and say sentences. It's amazing what happens um, when you see a child uh, gain that skill. Right. We're bringing together leading edge research and practice of our library, education, and human computer interaction faculty to re envision youth learning. But we can't do that without the creativity of Ms. Valerie Scott, frankly, or the research and dedication of faculty such as Ann Scott McLeod. We're building the future, the next 50 years of the iSchool, on a foundation that you have laid. Thank you very much. And so, so with that, I actually get now the pleasure to turn it over for questions uh, for Ms. Tripp. Do we have any questions? Can you come, back, come on back up. I'm supposed to moderate, but I think you'll be fine on your own. I don't, I don't really think that, you know, it's quite. Oh, yeah. So while she's coming up, I, uh, let me see if there are any questions. Do we have a, well, it's a small enough room. All right, we'll start over there, and then we'll work our way to the back. All right, so yeah, go ahead. For writing the American Girl books, um, real. Uh, where did my inspiration for writing the American Girl books come from? Initially, I think it came from a love of history, but daily, my inspiration comes from the children I write the books for. I'm lucky enough to have a lot of contact by through Skype or going to Girl Scout troops or libraries or schools or all different kinds of groups and speaking to the children and they're very um, they're very forthright uh, about giving me ideas, stories they would like me to write and they are my continuing source of inspiration. They inspire me because I always begin, no matter what period my character lives in, I always begin by thinking about my reader right now today and what her life is like in 2014. And I'd like to think of the story I write as a sort of a, a lovely silky satiny ribbon of connection that starts with her now and flows through time and connects her to this character that lived long ago. And that connection can be through emotion, it can be through shared experience, it can be through hopes, dreams, fears, but the, the integrity of that connection is the the emotion and the genuineness of the emotion. So it begins with my reader, and then as soon as I figure out what her life would have been like in the period of time that I'm writing about, then I'm I'm off and running. But the girls themselves, I would have to say the girls themselves, sometimes quite literally, a girl wrote me a letter and said, okay, I just broke my arm, I want Felicity to break her arm. So I, okay, well, I don't know, it's a bloodthirsty little thing. So I wrote a story about Felicity breaking her arm. It was fabulous. Back then they put like leeches on your arm and stuff. It was great. It was, so sometimes it's quite a direct inspiration, and other times it's, it's more of a universal sort of inspiration. That's a great question. We in the back. Yeah, hi. Where did I conduct my historical research and how long did it take? That's a wonderful question because um, really the research 
turns out to be your life. It's always there everywhere. Just the way everything I seem to read for the past eight months contributed to what I wanted to say today in this talk, so too at this fabulous thing happens. When you begin to be interested in a period of time, it turns out the whole world's full of the information you need. You just need to start paying attention. There was an article in the Washington Post just last week about how curiosity, you know, is very good for learning because it makes you hang on to pieces of information. So in some ways, I did my research growing up in a house with parents who grew up during the Depression. And so uh, I knew that my mother's father had lost his job, they had to take in boarders to pay the rent, that she was a maid, that she couldn't go to college, the college she wanted to go to because there was no money. So the kit stories grew out of the stories I lived with. And then in terms of the um, Samantha stories, I knew that story because of my old pal, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, with whom I was lucky enough to fall in love when I was 11. So I read everything and still do read everything I can get my hands on about her and her childhood. So I knew what that childhood was like. It, doing research is uh, breathing. Doing research is breathing. Um, when I was writing about Josefina, my family and I went to New Mexico for about five summers in a row. I had one chair in the Southwest reading room that I kind of started to think of as mine. If somebody else was in it, I, I was kind of a little fussed about it, to tell you the truth. And then I would, you know, sidle up to a lady in the grocery line, you know, hi, hi, and I try to, you know, strike up a conversation and then try to wheedle my way to be invited to her house so that I could ask her, you know, what did your mother tell you that her mother had told her mother was the most important thing for somebody to know? So research is talking to people and going places and trying things in addition to reading. But it's, I think it's just being aware. I think it's just being aware. That said, I'm also lucky enough that uh, there are researchers at American Girl who can and have told me exactly how much it would have cost to have a shirt, a man's shirt, dry cleaned in December in Cincinnati in 1934. So there are researchers who can answer very specific questions for me as well and be sure that my facts are accurate and right on the, right on the money. But you kind of have to do research to find out what you don't know. You know, you have to do a lot of research to find out what questions you need to ask. So, I love it. That's one of my favorite things. Did you go to Williamsburg? Oh, I went to Williamsburg so many times, people started to mistake me for one of the docents. <laughs> Truly. So many times. And I, I you know, I, my daughter, our daughter was just learning to walk at that time. And so the poor thing, I'd sling her in a backpack, drive down to Williamsburg, walk all around, you know, and everything. She, she learned to walk at Williamsburg, you know, pushing the, the stroller in front of her. So yes, I went to Williamsburg many, many times. That's an enchanting, that's a very enchanting place to go. And that's a wonderful way to gather impressions as well. So in fact, just for my birthday, just last month, my husband and I kind of cooked up this flimsy excuse that we had to go back to New Mexico because I'm writing that mystery about Josefina. So we were drinking in the atmosphere. I mean, that was essential research. <laughs> sure. So research is whatever you want it to be. Uh, any other questions here? No. Oh, Edie. Yes. Oh, Edie. First of all, it's very humbling. And I, I am embarrassed to admit that I thought, well, you know, I've been dealing with editors since I was 23 years old. I've been dealing with editors for 40 years. So I know what it takes to be an editor. No, I don't. Editing is a completely different art, a completely different art. And it has been very hard to learn how to. Editors are like psychiatrists who help you say what you really meant to say. They help you lead the life you really meant to lead. And I turned, I, I'm way too hands-on as an editor. I, I, it has been a very difficult task to learn how to say to a person, I don't understand this part, you know, how oh, oh, could you do it again? It's also very, very hard for me because I know how hard it is to write a paragraph and I don't want to, I, it pains me physically to ask a writer to cut a paragraph out. You're thinking, oh my gosh, I know how hard it was to do that. Look at that fabulous metaphor she's got going in there. And I just, I hate asking a person to cut things. You have to be a little, I don't mind cutting my own stuff as much as I mind cutting things that other people have written. So that is a very steep learning curve. And, and I, it's like, if you, not to mix my metaphors, but it's the myth of Sisyphus for me, that learning curve that I get partway up and slip right back to the bottom again. Very, very hard.
very hard to do. It has taught me to, to be extremely grateful to my editors. I'm so grateful that they are willing to dive into the muddy pit of my story with me and try to help us both climb out. I'm, I'm very grateful. So I've got a lot of learning to do right here. Works. It, yeah, works mm -hmm. together with the books, and is it a, yes. what's the chicken and what's the egg, and how, did, how does that, yeah. how does, and for the psyche of the child, you know, how that, yes. how that works together. Well, one thing about for the psyche of the child is that nobody has ever really sort of plumbed the depths of the mystery of how a child interacts with the doll. It's pretty cool. You know, sometimes you're the doll's mother, and then sometimes you are the doll. Then sometimes you're her best friend. It's very fluid, and so I think that's a fabulous play because that teaches you empathy. You're, you know, you're becoming someone else and trying to imagine how another person would feel. So I think doll play is, is great. The way it works for me with the stories is sometimes one thing comes first and sometimes the other. So I love to tell the story that I was just telling somebody before that with Kirsten, I did a lot of research. Kirsten's name was going to be Rebecca and she was going to be Norwegian. So I did a lot of research about Norway, you know, getting into the food, everything. And then one day Pleasant, who was the head of Pleasant Company and who started American Girl called me and said, you know, hold the presses. She said, uh, Kirsten, uh, Rebecca has to be Kirsten now, and she has to be Swedish, because I have found the most adorable Swedish sweater. So, <laughs> okay, so, but then in the case like of Kit, for example, I was able to say to the product developers, you know, Kit wants to be a reporter, so you've got to make a miniature typewriter. So sometimes the story dictates what the product are, will be, and sometimes the product has a big influence on, on the story. The appearance of the doll of, is, of course, very dependent on where she's from. When we were writing about Josefina, I had a board of advisors, and one of my advisors was a man named Felipe Mirabal. And Felipe cut off a chunk of his own hair, and we sent Felipe's hair to the doll factory so that we could see exactly what color hair Josefina should have. So I always think, you know, if, Josef, if Felipe goes bald, we're just going to buy Josefina doll, you know, cut off that, but he can like scotch, scotch tape that hair right back on top of his head. So sometimes the appearance and stuff about the doll has to do with where she's from and when she's from. And then other times it's, uh, it grows out of the story and who she is and what her character is. And I always like to say to children, you know, when Kit's father gives her this typewriter, and when your parents give you something, it's not just the object, okay? We gotta look at levels. It's not just a typewriter Kit's dad is giving her. He's saying to her, I think it's great that you want to be a writer. And when your mom drives you to soccer, she's not just saying, yeah, good, I'm glad you're playing soccer. She's saying, you know, I'm really proud of you for doing this. So every object has a reason and a meaning and a depth and a significance and a symbolism to it that supports the story, comes out of the story, supports the story. It's a very, it's very neatly intertwined. And I also believe firmly in uh, the synergy of story and object. I think objects have sort of energy in and of themselves. And when you interact with, an, that's why virtual will never replace actual. That's why we like books. You know, we like that weight of it in our hands. We like the sensual interaction with the object. And so I think that all of the things that go along with the books help the child lift the story up off the page and, you know, maybe think of another ending for a book. Girls are writing to me all the time saying, you know, we get to Molly's birthday party. You don't even tell us what kind of cake she has at the birthday party. <laughs> One girl said, I personally, the cake's my favorite thing. So she wrote a paragraph, you know, she wrote a whole chapter of Molly's party and she was interacting with that doll and the plates and the whole thing to extend that story the way she wanted to, which I was really thrilled, thrilled about. So the objects are sometimes inspiration and sometimes they're inspired by. It goes both ways. Could you tell us a little bit about the juxtaposition of writing for girls, which would feel very um, you know, as I said in my speech, I actually um, don't think that at heart, emotionally, I think the first thing a child is is a child. And I think that the task of childhood is exploration and experimentation. And I think that the important thing we have to say to any child is, you know, go ahead and, and try it and use your imagination. And I don't really feel that there's a difference in what we want to encourage boys to do and like and what we want to encourage 
encourage girls to do. And like, you know what? I've been thinking about this a lot. And I think having just said in my speech that we don't always write from our own experience, I think that growing up, I was always, it, you can see in that bio, I was always the tallest girl towering over the other kids. I never got the sense of myself as a, you know, hothouse violet shrinking, you know, I, that I never had the idea that I couldn't do anything that I tried to do. So I didn't get the I, message, I guess, that girls were different from boys in their interests or in what they were going to, to try to do. I actually believe, as I said, not in high, hard wiring, but haywiring. I believe that all of us are all things at various times and it shifts and changes as we go through life and thank goodness it does. Um, you know, I, little boys respond to your writing about them? They like it a lot. Okay. Oh yeah, they like it a lot. They think it's very funny and they, they like the adventure just the way girls like adventure. They like the human interaction, just that they are familiar with um, you know, personality conflicts and things. There's no divide. There's no divide. So I, I, I think um, we create that divide, and I think maybe that's a mistake to do. So are you standing up because it's time to go? Yeah, good. That's OK. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, before the uh, reception, we are gonna do a drawing and give away a copy of Valerie's new book. Um, so uh, I hope everybody who came in filled out one of these cards. Uh, if you did not, please raise your hand and we can get you one um, beforehand. Or if it's just one, you can have this one. <laughs> So before I, I draw this, I have to tell you a story. One time, uh, Addie was a new, uh, I guess Felicity was a new character, and I was doing a book signing in Falls Church, and the lady came with twins. So we didn't have enough mob caps to go around. So a girl named Dinah said, OK, well, the extra twin can have my mob cap. Three years went by, same store that I drew for who was going to win an Addie doll. Dinah won. Aww. So if you don't win today, don't cry. <laughs> Jewel, yeah, <laughs> Jewel Stoddard, yay! <laughs> Just what Jewel needs, another another children's book. Uh, Guiamina Tirado. Tornado. Who's here all the way from California? Good, we got a boy. Sam Tempchin. Oh, girl. Yay, Sam! Oh. <laughs> See, I told you there was no difference. Sam, yay, Samantha. <laughs> Well, I'm grateful to you and Joe, then. Thank you, Sam. So we're all, all finished? One more oh, one. OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Larry Liff. I'm the Director of Development and Alumni Relations for the College of Information Studies. Uh, so thrilled to see you all here today. And uh, thanks so much again to, to Valerie and the Library of Congress. You know, the McLeod Lecture is only made possible through the generosity of our donors. And these are the alumni of the school, the faculty and staff, the friends of uh, and colleagues of Anne, as well as people in the community who understand and share our value and the importance of library education and the study of children's literature. This lecture series is such a wonderful tribute to Anne's work, uh, her deep passion for the subject, but also as a transformative figure in the scholarly significance of the field. The mission of this lecture is to educate a general audience on different aspects of children's literature, to share the expertise and knowledge of authors and scholars. And isn't that one of the reasons that we write literature, to share our stories with a large population and a great community? If you liked Valerie's talk today and hope to come to future lectures, we need your help. Philanthropic gifts are 
the sole reason we can put this event on and the only way that we can continue to do so in the future. Information about giving can be found in your program, uh, or you can come talk to me. Uh, if anyone is considering supporting the lecture, the college is going to be offering a copy of Valerie's new book, for anybody who didn't win one today, uh, to any donor who makes a gift of $100 or more to the college between now and October 18th, which is Maryland's homecoming. Uh, so again, please consider giving, helping us continue to support this great lecture and honoring uh, Ann Scott McLeod. On behalf of the College of Information Studies, the Library of Congress, I want to thank you all again for coming. Please join us for our reception and join me in another round of applause for Valerie Tripp. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.